What do you do when the movement you spent the last half a decade aligning yourself with goes full mask off regarding the whole Nazi thing? Thankfully, I would never had to answer that question, but the same can't be said by leaders of the gender critical movement, including JK Rowling. As for her answer, it seems to be threaten anyone pointing out the truth, which, as we all know, is a bad idea. All her threats make me and many others want to do in response is delve into the crushing depths of the gender critical movement to shine a light on the fascism at its foundation. Yet first, a quick content warning for the following. Fascism, transmisia, anti-semitism, intimate partner violence, police violence, and medical violence. If you like our work and appreciate the research from each video, please consider supporting the channel via Patreon. You can also support us by liking, commenting, and sharing this video on social media. Hi there, my name is Ethel Thurston, she, her, they, them, and today we'll be unpacking JK Rowling's continued support for anti-trans fascism, specifically that propagated by fellow gender critical leader Kelly J.K. Minchel, and I will be showing hard evidence of said fascism in who she supports, as well as both Key Minchel and Rowling's glorification of anti-Semitism as brave. That's Rowling's word, not mine. I'll also be demonstrating the fascism inherent to the gender critical ideology, so there's a lot to get through and I want to get it right, so let's start with what provoked this response. On the 30th of March 2023, Channel 4 aired Gender Wars, a TV show that claimed to be an investigation into the controversy surrounding trans rights. That was not the case, however. What we instead got was a surface level retreading of long debunked lies surrounding the idea that trans rights are at odd with the rights of women, completely ignoring the fact that trans people in the UK have had legally guaranteed access to single sex spaces since 2010, and that the gender recognition reform, which in no way impacts that access, only affecting personal documents, is supported by 78.6% of all UK citizens, with polls finding cis women to be more supportive of said changes than cis men. Someone who felt similarly dismayed about the Channel 4 piece was queer journalist Patrick Strudwick, who published a scathing review, noting the piece's many shortcomings in detail, such as how the creators refused to push back on trans music claims in order to actually get to the bottom of the issue. He also noted a failure to acknowledge the far-right involvement in the gender-critical movement, stating that, quote, But the fallout from the anti-trans movement is wide, with shrapnel heading for all women and LGBTQ people. We know this because of the fascist takeover of transphobic ideas. In Melbourne this March, an anti-trans rally organised by British gender-critical campaigner Kelly J. Keane staged a mass Nazi salute. Last week, bomb threats were made to several branches of the American retailer Target in Utah in reaction to the store producing merchandise to celebrate LGBTQ pride. According to local reports, the threat was made citing the LGBTQ products controversy. This is an escalation of the ongoing Bud Light backlash when the beer brand hired Dylan Mulvaney, a trans influencer, to promote it, prompting a mass boycott and an outpouring of anti-trans vitriol. End quote. Which, I just want to be clear about, I disagree with on a fundamental level. Why? Well, because it states that fascism has taken over transphobic ideas, when in reality the anti-trans movement has always been fascist, a fact I'll be demonstrating later by scrutinising its two core beliefs. It has merely gone mask off more recently, much to the dismay of leaders who are still trying to deny their fascist foundation. One such leader is J.K. Rowling, a person who went from lying about having middle-aged moments regarding her anti-trans views, to becoming a full-on anti-trans saint to many in the gender-critical movement. Rowling responded to Strudwick's article, threatening him with legal action regarding the line he'd written about fellow gender-critical leader Kelly J. Key Minchel, organising a rally at which open Sieg Heiling Nazis turned up and mass Sieg Heiled. Now, to those of you familiar with Kelly J. Key Minchel, the creator of the deceptively named Lit Women Speak or LWS brand, this might be somewhat surprising. After all, isn't she the woman who chose a Nazi Barbie to be her icon on Spinster, the gender critical alternative to Twitter? And the answer to that is yes, yes she is, a fact she still hasn't explained to this day. It's for this reason, and many like it, that Rowling's actions were seen to be an escalation of her past behaviour. She is now forcing herself into the thick of everything, 
by threatening people calling out anti-trans fascism. We've come a long way from Rowling lying about her middle-aged moments. So the line regarding Key Minshall has been redacted, likely because Patrick's ambiguous wording could be taken to imply that Key Minshall was directly orchestrating the Nazi salute, which we don't know. Therefore, it's best just to remove it, especially when being threatened by a billionaire. What we do know is that on the 18th of March 2023, Open Sea Highly Nazis led by Thomas Sewell turned up to Key Minshall's LWS hate rally in Melbourne, Australia, with the explicit intent of supporting her. What we also know is that members of Key Minshall's rally were seen gleefully posing for photos alongside said Nazis, and that Key Minshall and her team took no issue with said Nazi support until the media began to cover what transpired. Quick side note, I have a playlist of videos covering Key Minshall's disaster of an Oceania tour, so if you'd like to know more, do check that out. The first and last videos are the most important in the series regarding fascism, with the rest filling in some other details. One such detail is how Key Minshall and her fellow Lit Women Speak organisers celebrated as police body-slammed Aboriginal senator and public sexual assault survivor Lydia Thorpe for having the audacity to try and have her voice as a woman heard on Aboriginal soil. Think about that for a second. Keen Minshall and the Lit Women Speak crew celebrated the assault of a cis woman of colour slash open survivor of sexual violence who tried to speak at their event. That should tell you all you need to know about the sham that is said brand. They don't actually want to let women speak, they only want to allow certain women to speak, specifically those they know will incite hatred against trans people. That's how it's always been, and this is what JK Rowling is throwing her support behind, people cheering police violence against women survivors of sexual abuse. Returning to Rowling, people began sharing evidence of said Nazis engaging with key speakers at the LWS rally, as well as a video of one of the Nazis explaining why police initially kept them separate to the LWS event, as they contacted its organisers, so Key Mitchell's team, possibly Key Mitchell herself, confirming that said Nazis should be allowed into the LWS space, which they did, hence the photos. There were groups of all different stripes there who saw eye to eye on this particular issue of, of the whole trans phenomenon. So it shouldn't matter um, what ideology you are, as long as you subscribe to the idea that women should be women and men should be men, which NSN obviously does, um, then they fit in that particular protest. And in the flyers and the, all, all the um, photos I saw promoting the rally on Telegram, etc., uh, nowhere, that, uh, nowhere that it say, you know, neo Nazis aren't welcome. It just it was an open invite to everyone who supported the idea of women's rights and, and women being women, etc., to go to that particular protest. And given that NSN does support the idea that women should be women and men should be men, um, they, they, they were allowed to be there legally and also just, you know, uh, socially. Um, all, all this media hype that they gatecrashed the event and they didn't belong is bullshit. And on top of that, all the footage shows that people from MSN, NSN were actually shaking hands with a lot of the protesters. They were exchanging details. Uh, a lot of people were asking who they were. Um, you know, Thomas Sewell was telling them what organisation um, was being re uh, he represented, etc. Um, not just journalists, but also just random people at, at the at the protest. And a lot of networks are formed and potential recruitment as well, which is which is great. Uh, the point is that um, at, at first, um, some of the people, protesters on the conservative side um, thought that NSM was Antifa. Then when they saw the banner, they realised they're actually not Antifa. Um, and it got to a point where um, the police, and this is based on what Tom said on a recent live stream with the Paletta, I think it was, the police um, actually wanted Tom and the boys to um, move in and join the main protest group um, and then Tom said I'll let you know because apparently he just wanted to get some photos etc some video footage uh, and then eventually after like half an hour or so um, the police uh, at the behest of uh, the organizers of the of the um, conservative protest because they asked them do you want these guys in and they said yes and they basically uh, moved NSN 
into the, the, the main area, which is why they were allowed to go on Parliament House, on the stairs of Parliament House. Of course, Rowling was desperate to deny said evidence, leading her to lash out at one such person with, quote, You can't honestly believe this will be considered proof of your allegations that feminists invited Nazis to a Lit Women Speak event in a court of law? Footage of a man sitting in a car making an unevidenced claim about an unidentified conservative group? End quote. Oh wow, you've got us there. If only we had evidence of said Sikh hiding Nazis being allowed to join the LWS event by police, with said LWS members cheering and rushing forward to shake their hands. Oh wait, we do have that. In fact, we have it from multiple angles. As we can see here, said Nazis were welcomed by the LWS members with open arms, and were even allowed to position themselves and their banner on the stairs of Parliament, just above one of the banners brought to said rally by LWS members, as noted by the shit in the earlier video. So, when there's video evidence to support what the fascist is admitting happened, yes, that would stand in court. However, I think we can do better than just a once-off, I think we can prove Key Mitchell's involvement with fascists at multiple levels, spanning multiple years, as well as the fascism inherent to the gender-critical ideology. Starting by defining what fascism is, because while some fascists, like Thomas Sewell, are more than happy to tell you what they are, there are many fascists who instead opt to hide behind coded language to try and avoid being called out. So we can't rely on fascists to tell us that they are fascist in order to spot them. We need to understand what makes a fascist a fascist and how it infects every part of their language. Two traits commonly cited as defining features of fascism are authoritarianism and ultranationalism. And whilst it's true that they are important, they are not, in fact, the defining feature of fascism. That would be palingenesis, the idea of national rebirth. Fascism argues that a thriving society becomes a target of undesirable people, often labelled degenerates, who seek to infect said society with a form of social decay, their degeneracy, resulting in the collapse of said society. Fascists also argue that the only way to break said degeneracy is to instigate violent ultranationalism, destroying the degenerates, bringing about a new golden age. That is why Mussolini viewed his flavour of Italian fascism to be the successor to the Roman Empire, whilst Hitler viewed the Nazis to be the successor to the German Empire, who were in turn the successor to the Holy Roman Empire. That's why the Nazis were the Third Reich, the Third Empire having its golden age. Now the targeted social group can differ from fascism to fascism, but regarding the fascism of Nazi Germany, it's Jewish people who face the brunt of it. The Nazis argued that the Jews were poisoning the German way of life, opening its borders to outsiders such as the Romani, extending compassion to the disabled, and turning the German people gay and transgender, acts Hitler believed to be responsible for, among other things, the loss of the First World War and the creation of the Weimar Republic. One particular man who drew the Nazis' ire was Magnus Hirschfeld, a Jewish sexologist who founded the Berlin Institute of Sex Research, which offered early forms of hormone replacement therapy and comprehensive sex education. Once the Nazis had risen to power, they raided the Institute and seized its research, which was then burnt in early book burnings, providing the bulk of what was destroyed. The Nazis then rounded up the Institute's members, both gay and trans, forcing them into concentration camps under the Pink Triangle. This history is key to understanding how the Nazis, and by extension other fascist groups, operate. How this idea of degeneracy is intimately tied to the notion of national death and rebirth. So we need to be on the lookout for said language or narrative. Another thing to be on the lookout for are common fascist conspiracies, such as the Big Lie. A concept invented by Hitler to describe what he saw as the overwhelming lies Jewish people pushed on the German people, with one example Hitler gave being the idea that German generals were responsible for the loss of the First World War. Another conspiracy is the Great Replacement, which is the belief that Jewish people are reducing white fertility whilst increasing immigration to try and raise white people from Europe, the US, and Oceania. Because fascism in these places is tied to white nationalism, in who it believes to be a 
proper citizen. We also need to be aware of how fascists seek to hijack other political movements, co-opting their language. For example, the Nazis famously label themselves nationalist, socialist, leaning heavily into this idea that they'd protect German workers. The reality, meanwhile, is that they never had any intention of doing so, and were just using that label to reach a wider audience. Not only do they dissolve the unions, but as Martin Niemöller famously said in his harrowing poem, first, they came for the socialists. This is why we can't trust fascists to tell us that they're fascists, and the only reason anyone would argue otherwise is if they're trying to help fascists go undetected. So with that understanding of fascism under our belt, we can now move on to assess Key Minchul, starting with our friends and allies. Friends and allies like Stephen Christopher Yexi Lennon, also known as Tommy Robinson. Yexi Lennon is someone with a long history of promoting the Great Replacement Conspiracy, particularly in regards to immigration from the Middle East. That is why he is recognised as a neo-Nazi in the UK. It's also why he has the open support of Kelly J. Key Minchul, who went so far as to claim that Yatesy Lennon had succeeded in protecting white girls where feminists had failed. This move was so blatantly fascist that it even resulted in some of her supporters, such as Jean Hatchet, leaving the movement over the dissonance they were feeling in claiming to be feminist when promoting open Nazis. Keen Minshaw also made a guest appearance on the podcast of one Jean-Francoise Garifray, a fascist who has publicly argued that the West needs to create a white ethnostate to keep out the undesirables mentioned earlier. Keen Minshaw's appearance on far-right platforms and glorification of them elsewhere, breaking bread with open fascists, normalising their presence, is ultimately what led people such as Thomas Sewell to feel welcome at her rallies. She may not have stated such in her words, but her very presence and glorification of these people was a tacit invite. Yet what's even more interesting is how this didn't stop following the events in Melbourne. Oh no. One of the people Key Minchel turned to following the news covering her openly Nazi supporters was Avi Yemeni of Rebel Media. Rebel Media being another fascist platform that parrots lies regarding the Great Replacement and was even linked to the Christchurch Massacre. Them and Yexi Lennon, whom Rebel Media sponsors. Indeed, Yemeni himself had once acted as Yexi Lennon's official spokesperson, meaning Key Minchel turned to a Nazi, working for a group of Nazis, acting as a spokesperson for another Nazi, linked to the Christchurch shooting way back in 2019, to deny her Nazi affiliations in 2023. He's also a convicted wife-beater, a fact I bring up due to Key Minchel and Rowling's claims of wanting to protect women. Avi Yemeni pleaded guilty to both malicious communications and physical battery against his now ex-wife in 2019, including throwing a chopping board hard enough that left a contusion on her forehead. He then left her to finish making his dinner, because that is, in his mind, what a woman is. A food-slash-sex dispenser turned occasional punching bag. That is who Key Minchel turned to as an alternative to mainstream media. That is who she turned to as a champion for women's rights, proudly mirroring their interview to her own channel in 2023, directly promoting him, a man who physically assaulted his wife as she made dinner, and then left her, quite literally, battered and bruised, to finish making it. Just in case there were any doubts about the lie that Kelly J. Key Minchel or J.K. Rowling give two shits about women victims of abuse. They really don't. Key Minchel happily promoted a convicted wife-beater slash Nazi, and Rowling offers to defend her for doing so. That is how JK Rowling has chosen to spend her money, defending people who promote wife beaters as the defenders of women. But that's just who Key Minchel surrounds herself with and promotes. Free open neo-Nazis. What about the Little Women Speak brand itself? Well, 
we have the fact that said events across Australia and Aotearoa earlier this year were publicly sponsored by the Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC. So then um, CPAC came along and said that they would sponsor our events and cover all of our insurance throughout our whole trip, uh, which is really kind of them. Um, but what we would need to do is we would need to show that we were working for them, working with them. Um, and so they are um, very kindly, they have sponsored our insurance throughout Australia, which means that if anything happens, uh, we are insured. Um, some women don't like it, apparently. And I say that if you want to sponsor our events, if you want to donate a large sum of money, uh, to our events, uh, you can also have your logo on our um, public advertising. But I have, I will not be answerable to anyone about the decisions that I make in order to allow women to speak. I am not answerable to anyone. Uh, I make the decisions because I think I'm right. That would be the very same CPAC whose leader openly referenced the Great Replacement as a reason to overturn Roe v. Wade. You know, the Nazi conspiracy that the Jews are trying to decrease white fertility to take over the world. That Great Replacement. That's who Key Mitchell refers to as very kind, making it clear that even if other people sponsored her, she put their name next to CPAC. She wouldn't remove her CPAC sponsorship even if she got the money elsewhere. That's who this champion of women chooses to work with. Those who called upon anti-Semitism to argue in favour of destroying the federally guaranteed right to safe abortion across the US. I don't know if you're noticing a pattern here. Though the examples of fascism don't end there, as can be heard in this video of a CPAC spokesperson taken from their US conference openly talking about the need to exterminate trans people from public life entirely. The problem with transgenderism is that its acceptance at any level necessarily entails the complete destruction of women's bathrooms, women's sports, all of the specific rights and spaces that women currently enjoy. There can be no middle way in dealing with transgenderism. It is all or nothing. If transgenderism is true, if men really can become women, then it's true for everybody of all ages. If transgenderism is false, as it is, if men really can't become women, as they cannot, then it's false for everybody too. And if it's false, then we should not indulge it, especially since that indulgence requires taking away the rights and customs of so many people. If it is false, then for the good of society, and especially for the good of the poor people who have fallen prey to this confusion, transgenderism must be eradicated from public life entirely. The whole preposterous ideology at every level. Again, this is who Key Mitchell happily takes money from, plastering their branding all over her Lit Women Speak events literal fucking fascists who believe in the Great Replacement and want to eradicate trans people. Yet JK Rowling would lie to you and claim that this isn't inviting said Nazis to her events because Key Mitchell didn't explicitly say the words, I want fascists to join us. All she did was put up a sign, letting them know that they're welcome. But it gets worse when we actually take a moment to listen to the rhetoric platformed at LWS events, such as this now infamous speech. So we need to protect our language forever. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, that woman. Hello. Language, language is the thing. And I'm here, I was here, I went to Speaker's Corner almost two years ago and was far too scared to speak. And I tell you, I'm not scared now. I'm really ready to talk. Now, I'm going to talk to you about something that I haven't seen in the press. I'm a hypnosis practitioner and I've been doing hypnosis for 30 years and helping people to, to hypnotize others. And I know about language. 
And I know that this is based on something we call the big lie. Do you know the big lie? The big lie was first described by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. The big lie is such a big lie that ordinary people like us think, well, that can't be a lie because I'd never tell any bigger li as big a lie as that. We only lie in small ways. The big lie, well, there is one big lie going on and it was begun by men in oh, the early part of the 20th century. It was began when they had an erotic fantasy and they decided they were gonna sell us the big lie. And what is the big lie? The big lie is trans women are, but they're not, are they? They're men and we know that. Emotions, emotions are what caught them. They got caught not by rational things, they got caught by emotions. And how are we gonna break this? is by using emotions that shake them out so they can't find that emotion of sympathy ever again. Thank you. Hi, okay, who's next, who's next, who's next? They just let the speaker promote the anti-Semitic conspiracy of the big lie this time relating to trans people, and not a single person stops to question her. Not even when she notes the fact that said conspiracy was first described by Hitler in Mein Kampf. In fact, why don't we just play those clips back to back? The part where she introduces the big lie, and the praise she receives for doing so. Do you know the big lie? The big lie was first described by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf. Hi. Compare the reaction to her versus, say, the women who infiltrated the LWS events to speak in support of trans people. They were immediately cut off, choked, or even slammed to the ground. Yet these people stood there, cheering on a woman invoking Hitler, whilst people in the livestream chat were doing the same and were even donating. This fact was called out in January of this year, and yet the video is still on Key Mitchell's account as of the time I write this. She is still proud of this, and that's what JK Rowling is choosing to support. That's who JK Rowling is defending against accusations of fascism, someone who platform speakers openly referencing Hitler as their source of information on the existence of trans people. The man who stormed the Berlin Institute because he believed it was turning German people gay and trans. The man who committed genocide against the Jewish people to try and put an end to their degeneracy. Yeah, as someone who routinely tackles the gender critical movement, I'm not shocked by all this in the slightest. Why? Well, because the gender critical movement is inherently fascist. There are two core narratives shared by all adherents of the gender critical ideology, narratives spun regarding trans people to paint us as a result of degeneracy. Narrative 1, trans men and AFAB Emmy folk are in fact girls who have been indoctrinated into believing that they're trans, what gender-critical fascists label rapid-onset gender dysphoria. This social contagion, so they argue, leads trans men and AFAB envy folk to transition, becoming infertile, thus decreasing white fertility, helping the great replacement mentioned earlier. We see this argument in just how obsessed gender-critical leaders, such as Key Mitchell, are with fertility, framing gender-affirming care as a deliberate attempt to groom and sterilize children, as can be seen here. But what's the alternative? We either stand firm or we let, we let more and more kids get sterilised. We get more and more kids get gaslit at schools. You know, there's, there's no choice. Once you know what's going on, you can't, you can't go back to not knowing. You can't, you can't unsee the fact that they are gaslighting children and putting women at grave danger. It's just like these kids have no idea what they're supporting. That groomers support trans youth. A narrative that is openly parroted by literal Sig Heiling Nazis, like those that turned up to support Key Minchel at a hate rally the day before. 
In this country, we have medical professionals performing double mastectomies on teenage girls. And that is a fact. If you are under 18 years of age, you can have your breast removed. But you cannot get a tattoo. You cannot buy cigarettes. But the government allows young girls to have surgery because they think they were born in the wrong gender. That is the sort of society we live in. That is the sort of society that is provided by your own government. And we are medical professionals. As for who is responsible, one only has to read the published books of gender critical leaders, such as Helen Joyce's Trans, When Ideology Meets Reality. Helen Joyce's book gives us three names that are routinely brought up by gender critical fascists George Soros, John Stryker, and Jennifer Pritzker, all three of whom are Jewish. This is in spite of there being plenty of wealthy non Jewish folk who also support trans people. The reason they don't get mentioned is because supporters of rapid onset gender dysphoria believe that it is a Jewish shadow state that is pushing transitioning onto young white girls, getting money in the process before using that money to further their control. It is modern day blood libel. And these people know what they are doing. They are fully cognizant of their Nazi beliefs, which is why when pressed on it, they'll quickly try to change the topic. We heard this in a radio interview by Kim Hill with Kim Mitchell. Reminder that this is a very person J.K. Rowling is defending by threatening a queer journalist. When you were asked about the motive of the trans lobby, you said at the extreme end, it's very dangerous people who want access yes. to children and an entire dismantling of society. Do you think that that is not catastrophizing? Do you not know about the billionaires who are the billionaire men who are pushing this ideology and funding it? Are you not aware of those people? No, tell me are more. Are you saying that that doesn't happen? No, tell me more. You just need to... No, women across New Zealand... We are, they are very, very aware that there are men in women's spaces, men in women's sports, and they are giving carte blanche access to, unfettered access to women's spaces as soon as you say that those men are part of uh, the transgender ideology. As soon as you, as soon as a man basically puts on a dress, he is given unfettered access to women's spaces, uh, including prisons, including uh, rape crisis centres. And I just think it's absolutely preposterous if you don't think women across New Zealand are afraid of that. Could you, you please just... tell me a little more about the billionaires funding the transgender lobby? Well, yes, you've got Big Pharma, for example. They make a substantial amount of money out of transgenderism. I want to know why it's not important to a journalist to address the fact that there are men in women's spaces. It's really important why as a journalist for me to know more about the billionaires funding the transgender lobby. And happy. since you raised it, and since you raised it, I'm interested to know further mm -hmm. details. What can okay. you tell me? Well, I would, like to, I would like to know why, as a journalist, you are prepared to be distracted by that 
as opposed well, to... But you mentioned man. it. Notice how Key Mitchell throws the conspiracy out there, but the moment she's asked to name names, she realises she's fucked up. That if she starts listing Jewish names, Kim Hill is going to point out exactly what she's doing. That's why she's so quick to try and flip the narrative, acting as if Kim Hill was the one who brought the topic up, when no, it was her. If Key Mitchell didn't realise she was being anti-Semitic, she just named names. So the fact that she clearly has specific people in mind but refuses to give those names demonstrates that she knows that she's being anti-Semitic here and is afraid of being called out on it. That is who Rowling defends. Though this is not the first time JK Rowling has defended a raging anti-Semite, just consider this paragraph from her 2020 essay on trans people. Quote, Months later, I compounded my accidental light crime by following Magdalene Burns on Twitter. Magdalene was an immensely brave young feminist and lesbian who was dying of an aggressive brain tumour. I followed her because I wanted to contact her directly, which I succeeded in doing. However, as Magdalene was a great believer in the importance of biological sex and didn't believe lesbians should be called bigots for not dating trans women with penises, dots were joined in the heads of Twitter trans activists and the level of social media abuse increased." End quote. This is the same Magdalene Burns who, while she was alive, routinely parroted the anti-Semitic conspiracy that Jewish billionaires were trans in youth, listing the same Jewish people Helen Joyce would go on to list in her book. And Burns' anti-Semitism was documented before she died. Yet J.K. Rowling still decided to label her, and by extension her legacy of flagrant anti-Semitism, as brave. This means that J.K. Rowling has a repeated history of defending violent anti-Semites. Because yes, spreading the lie that Jewish people are infecting society with degeneracy makes them a target for violent pogroms. Last year we covered how the Buffalo Shooter explicitly lists this as justification for their atrocities. Then there's the Christchurch massacres mentioned earlier. J.K. Rowling has directly lended a hand to said violence, twice. Three times if we count her attempts to appropriate and normalise the reptilian conspiracy as something other than an anti-Semitic mouthpiece. Because let's be clear, people are not calling JK Rowling a reptilian. But do you know who is often painted as such? If you guessed, people who support trans inclusivity, you'd be right, as seen in this comic by gender-critical icon Tatsuya Ishida. This is just another anti-Semitic dog whistle used in place of the Jew, which we covered in our piece on the Buffalo Shooter. So given that context, I can't help but see this as anything but a deliberate attempt to muddy the waters and trivialise said anti-Semitism. Which seems to be becoming a pattern, by the way. Following the whole Oxfam debacle in which a figure based on a demon from Doom was argued to have a striking similarity to J.K. Rowling, Fred Sargent, the guy who kept calling the police on the Stonewall Inn and subsequently labelled himself a Stonewall veteran, drew direct comparison between the image and the Eternal Jew, a Nazi propaganda film. This is in spite of the fact that he works alongside people quite literally citing the big lie and the great replacement to demonise trans people and those who support them. This shift seems to be a desperate bid to reframe the narrative after the events of Melbourne, Australia, to paint the victims of their fascism as the real fascists. So that's the first narrative dealt with, leaving us with narrative two. Trans women and AMAB MB folk are in fact just cis men, lying to gain access to women's spaces so that they may rape them. We actually saw this one in JK Rowling's most recent post, in her paragraph stating that quote, Nobody but useful idiots can be genuinely surprised that real fascist has spotted a glorious opportunity in trans activism. The homophobic, anti-feminist far right has long held that the left is degenerate, foolish, immoral and authoritarian, and now they can point to the incoherent arguments of gender ideologues, the bullying tactics of the no-platforming, and the swarms of masked men 
threatening violence against women for wanting to retain single-sex spaces, and Crow, we told you so, end quote. Except, as we all know, trans women in the UK have had access to women's single-sex spaces since 2010 without incident. Hell, we even have peer-reviewed science that proves that the passage of trans-inclusive laws, like those that have existed in the UK since 2010, quote, are not related to the number or frequency of criminal incidents in these spaces, end quote, with said research concluding that, quote, this study provides evidence that fears of increased safety and privacy violations as a result of non-discrimination laws are not empirically grounded, end quote. So when a person, particularly in the UK, attempts to fall back on this idea that it's about protecting single-sex spaces, they are nothing more than a damn dirty liar. And yes, I'm looking at you, JK Rowling. But that isn't even the worst thing about this paragraph. Sure, she lies about trans people presenting a marginalised group as inherently criminal, but she does so whilst making the claim that trans people fighting for our very existence has proven the fascist right, that our unwillingness to go silently into the night validates their claims that we're nothing more than dirty degenerates. I don't know why JK Rowling for openly agreeing with Nazi scum was a good idea, but that's exactly what this paragraph says. You fought back against fascism, proving said fascist, Right. Tell me, how is it feminism to say that victims of anti-trans violence defending themselves justifies said initial violence? It's not. It's a con. A lie. Rowling is invoking the veneer of feminism to hide her personal fascism. Because yes, she demonstrates an understanding of fascism, all the way up to the language of degeneracy, and defends said usage in her fellow Nazis. This post isn't merely an escalation in how she's actively threatening opponents of anti-trans fascism, it's evidence of her own fascist beliefs. The only person that agrees with Nazis on core Nazi beliefs is another Nazi. And she can fucking threaten me for pointing that fact out all she wants. I don't give a shit. She isn't a feminist, and neither is Kelly J. Keene Minshew. Because whilst Keene Minshew will lean heavily into people implying that she's feminist, as can be heard in this clip taken from the radio interview played earlier... Obviously you're referring to the Nazis, the men in black giving the Nazis salutes. Yeah, having anything to do with me. What a horrible, disgusting lie. Um, and, And that's because... Every time women speak about our rights, men, particularly men in dresses, and 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 their I've never seen any feminist ways. rally be attended by Nazi men other than to oppose it. But they I were know, supporting doesn't you. It, doesn't it make you Why do you think they were supporting you? Here she is on the ground, mere hours before that interview, making her thoughts on feminism absolutely clear. I'm not a feminist. I'm not a feminist. If Key Mitchell was honest, why would she change her position like this within hours of one another? Why would she happily accept people like Rowling labeling her and her work feminist, only to declare otherwise on the ground? It's almost like she's doing the same thing that the Nazis did when they claimed to be socialist, using that word to reach a wider audience whilst admitting the lie to her core followers so as not to alienate them. There is no such thing as gender critical feminism. There is only gender-critical fascism. Because whilst J.K. Rowling rightfully points out the facts that fascists don't really care about protecting women, neither does she. That's why she defends a woman with a history of promoting convicted wife-beaters like Avi Yemeni. That's why she defends a woman whose official work account cheered the police assault of Aboriginal woman and public survivor of sexual assault, Lydia Thor. Rowling couldn't give two shits about women. They're just talking points for her, a pawn for her to use to incite violence against trans people, accusing us of crimes we never committed. That sign JK Rowling and Thomas Sewell have in common. We are here to protect the children. We are here to protect the women. 
the What Do You Lot Think? Is this post J.K. Rowling confirming what I and others have been saying for a while now? Can she come any more mask off at this point? Do you think she'll threaten to sue me even though I live in India? Did you notice something I missed? If so, be sure to let me know down below. And if you appreciate what we do here and want to help out, please consider becoming one of our wonderful patrons who make our work possible. On that note, we'd just like to thank the following people. Matthew Kovac, Gert Van Voorst, Hannah Banghart, Marble Wings, Sosh Daniels, Flynn, and Higgins the Seagull. And for myself, Adita and Levi, take care now.